I'm here with legendary economist Gary Schilling and president of A. Gary Schilling and Company. So what can you tell me about where U.S. markets are right now, where equities are, and do you think they're headed for a downturn? Well, you can say they're expensive, but you could have said that last year and the year before and the year before and the year before. I mean, they obviously have, have, have run away on the upside, and you have stock market growing much faster than the economy, and sooner or later, uh, that won't last. But, you know, forever is a long time. You don't know how long it's going to last. There's nothing on the immediate horizon that says that you've got a, a problem. And what usually happens, bear markets are associated with recessions, and they're caused by two things. One is the Fed tightens. They never intend to precipitate a recession, but by my count, 11 out of 12 times in the post-World War period, they've gotten a recession. The only soft landing was in the mid-'90s. Uh, now, the Fed is, is tightening. They're selling off their portfolio, raising the funds rate. But there's enough, there's so much excess liquidity in the system, I think it'd take a couple of years for them to do the job. The other, the other uh, a cause of recessions in bear markets is a, is, a, is a shock, a financial shock, and that's what we had in the late 90s with the uh, dot-com uh, explosion, and then, of course, the mid-2000s with the collapse in subprime mortgages. And if you look right, around right now, there's nothing that's really that big that sort of just stands out and says, this is, this is just cruising for a bruising. But I think if, if there is a candidate, it's probably what's happening in emerging markets. They have huge debts dollar-denominated debts, and with the dollar soaring, and that, I think, is a very key factor, it takes more and more of their local currency to service those debts. Also, most commodities are, are priced in dollars, so as a dollar goes up, it takes more of their local currency to buy their commodity imports. So if there, if, there, if, there is a, if there is a crisis coming, I think it's in these countries. And of course, you see Argentina and Turkey as the standouts in terms of big problems. And what sort of indicators can investors look at to see if trouble is coming from one well, of these places? Well, the, the, the big question right now in these developing countries is the risk of contagion. I mean, so far, you've got, you've got uh, Argentina as, as the usual uh, problems. Uh, Venezuela is a basket case. I mean, that economy is barely functioning. You wonder why they don't have some kind of a revolution. And Turkey, where the president has really, well, he really hyped the economy with a lot of spending financed by uh, hard currency borrowing, and now they're dealing with that, that problem. But if, that, if those things spread, if you go back to the late 1990s, you had the currency collapse in Thailand, and then it spread to other East Asian countries, and then to Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, and only to Russia. It's the contagion which is the issue, and that's something you, you're really hard to predict. You just have to keep your eye on it, and if you wake up one day and find out that people are retreating. Now, people are, pull, are uh, they're not putting money into emerging markets. You look at mutual fund flows, and they virtually cease. Last year, tremendous rush in there. People thought this was a, this was a great place to invest. The developed world didn't look all that strong. Mm -hmm. I'll put it there. And they forgot that these economies really don't grow on their own. They're dependent on exports. They're dependent on borrowing. And, and uh, they obviously are not sustainable. But, but as I say, if you start to see massive outflows of mutual funds and ETFs that are invested in emerging markets, I think that's probably as good as indicators any that uh, the end is near. And you said 11 out of 12 times Fed tightening leads to a recession. Right. So is, how is the Fed doing so far, and what can they do to be the 1 out of 12 times? Well, the Fed is moving very slowly. They obviously are concerned about upsetting the, the apple cart. And they, and, they, so they, they, they're, and they are not only raising interest rates, but now for the first time ever, they're selling off a portfolio. They've never had that huge portfolio, the result of quantitative easing after bailing out Wall Street. So they've got both those issues. And as they say in the past, they haven't had much success in soft landings when it was just raising interest rates. And they've had experience using interest rates as a policy instrument for literally a century. Now they're add and, and not too much luck with that. And now they're adding selling off the portfolio. So I think you can pretty well say that in time they'll do the job. But they're, they're moving slowly. They're moving cautiously. And of course, one of the interesting things is you're not getting the rise in long-term interest rates that they probably would expect. Uh, there is a question of, of, uh, of wages. They're not, they're not going up. I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. But it isn't the kind of world that the Fed uh, is interested in. They have uh, now. Powell is a different animal. He's he's uh, he's not a uh, economist, and I'm glad that and I'm a PhD economist. But I'm glad that, that there's somebody else other than economists at the helm there, because they tend to be very theoretical. They believe, for example, in the Phillips curve. They can't understand why they why the low unemployment rate 
hasn't pushed up inflation. Well, there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, you're getting a shift of employment. The jobs are created in low paid areas like hospitality and retail and so on and so forth. You've got globalization, probably the most important development in the last three decades on a worldwide basis, which is holding down wages, decimated manufacturing jobs in this country. A lot of reasons. But these Fed economists, you know, the Fed, a lot of the board members and economists there, they still the fish crash and wait a minute, it's, going, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, you know, it's coming, but when? Is the Phillips curve model broken? Is it not no yeah, longer relevant? Yeah, it, 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 it really is. And, and I think one of the things that they are just, they're just not compensating on. Now, this is, this, I'm playing my song here, and I'm, I'm a bias. I mean, in 1981, when the yield on the long term, on the long bond, the 30 year Treasury, was 12.6%, I said we're earning a bond rally of a lifetime. And since then, that yield has dropped to 3%. And, and as a result, uh, uh, long treasuries have outperformed, outperformed the S&P on a total return basis by six times in the interim. So I'm very much, I'm, and, and the whole basis of that forecast was the idea that inflation was on the, on the way out. And I think that's the thing that the Fed just doesn't understand, that we're in a, basically a deflationary world. You look at the excess supply that's opened up with globalization. You look at the downward pressure on wages I mentioned a minute ago. Um, there are a lot of factors here. They, look at what's happened to the Uberization of the world, if you will, where, where people are working part time. They're trading off income and benefits and so on for, for uh, flexibility in their pay. Uh, you've got a lot of very uh, strong deflationary pressures. And of course, protectionism simply adds to that. And I just don't think the Fed is comprehending the strength of that. Do you think our inflation measures are incorrect, the, the current ones we're using? Well, the, the, they're, they're correct for what they measure. They're correct for what they're measuring. Of course, there's always this attempt to show that inflation is higher than you think it is. And everybody thinks it is. I mean, I mean, you, you or I pay, uh, pay more for, for any product and we say, well, it's the devil personified. If we, if we pay less, oh, I'm a great shopper. I'm really a good bargainer. <laughs> you know, people are, are very unrealistic about that. And, and of course, they, there's all kinds of alternative measures of inflation. The Cleveland Fed has one where they sort of chop off the extremes and look at, look at the middle, or some of them are concentrated on the most frequently purchased uh, items like bread and gasoline and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, the, num the numbers for what they measure are, are, are I think, are, 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 are correct. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that they are going to have the kind of relationships that the Fed thinks, thinks they should have with uh, the employment. I mean, you know, one of the reasons the unemployment rate is low is you had so many people drop out of the labor force. Well, a lot of those people, the, the post-war babies retiring, okay, they left. But now, what's ha and, and there were a lot of other people that left. The younger people stayed in school. They said, I'll get more education, better sh chance at a job. And, and people in between, uh, the, the post-war babies and these young people, they just said there are no jobs available. What's happened now? The younger people are graduating from high school, from college. They're coming back in. People in the middle, they're coming off the bench. You look at numbers back in June, uh, the, the unemployment rate went down. Why? Now because fewer jobs have more people enter the labor force. They heard the jobs are available. They rushed in. And the interesting thing is on the, on the top end, people over 65, their, their labor force participation rate, the number of people who are out there looking for jobs or employed, is increasing faster than that population. That population is growing very rapidly with the retiring post-war babies. So you have, a, you, have a, you have some really interesting dynamics in the labor force, which I think have a lot to do with, with, the, with the restraint on wages. So are wages going to go up? Yeah, they're going up, but they're not going up much faster than in, in inflation right now. And I don't see any reason why that's going to going to change anytime soon. Now, of course, that's a very important uh, development because I think that is really what has spawned, spawned populism in this country. Populism, a lot of other areas, of course, have it, but I think that's what got Trump elected because in, in the U.S. and in, indeed all the G7, the major developed countries, they've had literally no growth in inflation-adjusted wages, no growth in purchasing power for over a decade. And so what happens? You know, people are, people are mad as hell. <laughs> they're just not, they're just not going to take it anymore. <laughs> you remember the, the movie yeah. Network? Uh, and, 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 and I think that's what got Trump elected. And of course, that's, that's what he's playing to. Now, he blames, he blames this on, on uh, immigrants and, and, uh, and imports. Uh, it's, it's not that simple in my view. Uh, globalization has a lot to do with the other factors I mentioned earlier, but, but it, is, it is a fact. And I don't see that changing demonstrably unless we put a complete 
tariff all around the country, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, you look at China. China is, is, a, is a big target. They're the bad guys. And, you know, they have cheated by international rules, at least as we interpret them. But what's happening? The low-end manufacturing is moving to Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and, of course, the 800-pound gorillas, India. Boy, India, the population is still increasing, and those guys get their act together, and I think they are. Uh, they're going to they're going to outdistance China. So the idea that this whole thing is going to is going to change uh, is is just is just not relevant. And of course, in the meanwhile, you've had a huge change in technology. A lot of people who are not adapt at, at today's technology are are left behind. And this has happened a lot faster than normal. That always happens. Some people, ever since industrialization started in the late 1700s in, in England and New England, people of jobs have disappeared. Remember, interesting example of that, the word saboteur. Saboteur, that is, comes from sabot. Sabot were wooden shoes that the uh, early the weavers would grind into the power rooms to wreck the machinery because they're putting them out of business. And that's how the word saboteur came from Sabbath. Uh, so there's always been people that have been left out. But, but the thing is that, that uh, industrialization has, as technology, if you will, has created more jobs than it's destroyed. People who build the machines, cheaper products, more consumers, more, more demand, uh, maintenance, developing new technology. But, but globalization has speeded up that process. And you sort of got this big gap. And, and it's really, I think from here on, we've probably, we've, we've exported just about all the manufacturing in this country that we can. We're down to irreproducible minimum. You go back to the early 90s, uh, about 20% of the labor force was in manufacturing. Now it's 12%, but it's, but it's leveled off. So that, that process is, is probably over. But, but the problem is that, that a lot of people simply have not adapted to the new technology. And of course, a lot of the jobs being created require more than just this brawn or some guy twisting on bolts in an auto, auto plant. And what do you think about Trump's trade war? What's the outcome going to be? Here's the point that I continue to make. When you've got plenty of supply in the world, and I think you do, plenty of industrial capability, plenty of raw materials and so on, it's the buyer that has the upper hand, not the seller. The buyer has, has the ultimate power. And who's the buyer? U.S. is the buyer. China's the seller. And beside that, you say, if, if we weren't buying all those consumer goods from China, and you and I enjoy them, they're cheap, they're, they're, they're great, but if, if we weren't buying them, where would China sell them? They have no other place to sell them. And in the meanwhile, China's growth is slowing. They got a problem of, of huge debt expansion. They're trying to, to curb. They're trying to to, to deal with uh, shadow with sh shadow lending, uh, shadow uh, shadow banking system, and so on and so forth. Uh, China isn't going to collapse, obviously. But I think in this in this trade war that that uh, that U.S. has the upper hand. If you look at how this whole thing developed after World War II, uh, the rest of the world was pretty much in ashes, and we were promptly into the Cold War. So I think that implicitly or explicitly, we basically said we will let Japan and Europe export freely into the U.S. because that gave them the growth to, 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 re, or to, to revive in a Cold War era. And that was cheaper for us than garrisoning even more U.S. troops around the world and having more border wars. Well, that was fine. But that era is over, and globalization has replaced it. So it's an entirely, it's an entirely different scene. And I think as a result, you, you, you have this situation where China, you know, China grew basically through exports, and they went to Europe and North America. But, you know, they, they, they did it with uh, some rather underhanded. We let them into the World Trade Center in 2001, and they basically have not fulfilled their promises. They have not opened up the, the technology. They not open up to our investments. They, they, they steal our technology. They, they, they demand tech transfer for companies that want to operate in China and so on. And, and so you, you've got a situation now where China is basically playing by the old game when everybody could export to the U.S. But now when you see the unemployment problem, no growth in purchasing power in, in, in average for the average guy, the, the, the non-supervisory uh, and production employees, no growth in real incomes for a decade. And, and that has changed the whole scene. And that's, I think that's, that's really what uh, has gotten Trump elected. And, and he's basically saying, hey, wait a minute. We got the upper hand here and we're going we're gonna to go ahead. Now, they could go to the mat. Uh, Xi, who is basically the president for life in China, uh, and, and Trump, he won't be around forever, of course, uh, but they could go to the mat and you could get a uh, really nasty all-out trade war and a, and a, a serious global recession. Um, I'm not predicting that. I think they probably will settle and China will begrudgingly give ground. They'll import more U.S. goods. 
they'll ease up on required tech, tech uh, transfer, steal less of it. Uh, they're not going to change their, their, their views entirely. But I think under pressure, they probably will, will give way and will end up uh, winning the trade war. I mean, people say nobody wins trade wars. Yeah, in the short run, you don't. But in the long run, if it's a matter of changing what has been the world exporting to the U.S. and the U.S. buying it, and what do we do? We give them paper. That's why they own half of our treasuries. Uh, uh, I think that I think that I think that is being reversed, and in the long run, you uh, will will be better off. So, if you could give me one piece of investment advice for people who are looking at the markets today, what would it be? It would be to belong the dollar. Now, I know that's not that's not going out and buying a stock. There are exchange traded tra uh, uh, funds on the dollar. But I think the dollar is is going to it, it's really been declining since 1985. Beginning of this year, I think it's turned around, and it is a safe haven. Uh, you have all the problems with the uh, with the developing world, uh, protectionism, and it's interesting. Whenever there's trouble in the world, even if we start it, the dollar benefits because it's the safe haven. It's people where people want to be. So I'm, I'm, I think that uh, being in the dollar, and you have to look at that broadly because uh, companies that, that suffer when the dollar is strong, I mean, exporters uh, suffer and, and uh, people in the supply chains can be affected positively or negatively. But I would look at the dollar as the overarching theme and then look at the implications of that. And biggest mistake you think investors broadly are making? Probably the biggest mistake investors have been making is, is betting that this economy was going to give out sooner than it has. It won't grow forever, uh, but it has, it has continued to grow, and I think there's been um, probably too much pessimism. Of course, the problem is when pessimism turns to optimism, then the end is near.